Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, as Lyle said, I'm Ed Byford. I'm the product lead for RabbitMQ. Um, we're here to talk to you today about some updates. Um, we want to talk about what's happened in the past year um, and also what's coming up in the future. Um, it's great to see so many faces here. I think I might have met some of you back when RabbitMQ Summit was in London a couple of years ago. I could tell it's a couple of years ago now because uh, my t-shirt seems to have got a little bit small around the waist. Uh, so yeah, it's been that time. So without further ado, um, wanted to cover off the lay of the land as we see it today, because one major announcement we have made in the last year was the GA of both the Tanzu RabbitMQ for Kubernetes offering and the Tanzu RabbitMQ container image. And these offerings are designed to be used in tandem. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the VMware Tanzu brand, it's essentially VMware's at brand and offering that's aimed at enabling application developers to deliver value via rapid and easy creation and deployment of software. And this really aligns nicely with RabbitMQ's developer focused APIs and the ethos of making it really easy to get started with for developers. So on the screen, you can see we've got Tansy RabbitMQ, that's the commercial container image, which contains RabbitMQ plus additional commercial plugins, which add capabilities for enterprises and those of you operating RabbitMQ at scale. So for example, there's internode traffic compression, which can significantly reduce the cost of running uh, a distributed RabbitMQ that's spread across availability zones in cloud environments, because it reduces the amount of network traffic that's sent in and out of those availability zones. There are other plugins which automate, for example, the replication of the metadata uh, within RabbitMQ between clusters, and soon that will be able to do messages as well. We'll cover that in a sec. So we also package and security scan all the dependencies, so you're getting a more secure software supply chain. And this can be run either in a docking container on a VM, or for best results, it could be used in conjunction with the offering above. The offering above, as you'll see, is Tansy RabbitMQ for Kubernetes. And this is a set of Kubernetes operators which orchestrates and automates day zero, day one, and day two activities. And the vision is that these operators will perform orchestration of active, passive disaster recovery setups and failovers across multiple Kubernetes clusters. And the whole offering is commercial, but there are two open source operators which perform activities within a single Kubernetes cluster, such as scaling up, automated rolling upgrades, and allowing you to create RabbitMQ messaging topologies via the Kubernetes API. So if you would like to try them out, they're freely available from GitHub. So we know many of you use RabbitMQ at work, and really the launch of these two offerings represents the major advancement in capabilities for enterprises using RabbitMQ. Um, and this joins the existing commercial offering, that is the one you can see on the right, which is for Cloud Foundry. But we also have a lot happening in the past year in the core broker as well. Uh, we'll go into more detail about what that means, but suffice to say for now that today, in fact, before the weekend, RabbitMQ 3.9 release candidate became available. And this contains streams, which is our big announcement. We'll go into a little bit of later and our know we'll talk in more detail about later in the day. But it also contains numerous other improvements. So we've got logging in JSON, thanks to the new Erlang Logger API. We've got peer discovery improvements and cluster formation improvements. Um, there's better binding recovery and even more. So please download it, try it out, leave feedback via the mailing list or via GitHub issues. Uh, and as you can see from the screenshot, it was released by one of our team members, Zen, who for the avoidance of doubt is the rabbit. Uh, his Git commit history is a bit patchy, but he does all right on releasing things. He also published RabbitMQ 3.6.15, so. So 
before we move on to the specific updates within some of the offerings, we wanted to talk a little bit about the themes. And really the great thing about working on RabbitMQ is the sheer number of different users and customers that we get to speak to. We see a broad cross-section of the things people care about when setting up event-driven architectures. So we thought it'd be interesting to talk about some of these. Uh, maybe you might recognize some of these from your own work as well, and then talk about how the team's actually responding to those needs and those themes. So the first broad theme we see is scalability. So event-driven architectures, they need to be able to grow and support increased traffic with every app that's connected to them. And we want to build on the high throughput that's offered by streams and think in future about how else we can enable RabbitMQ to support ever larger global architectures. The next one's observability critical part because as a mission critical component in an infrastructure the eventing and messaging broker should be easy to observe and easy to troubleshoot and the industry's really adopted prometheus and open metrics um, so we like to plug into that stability and resiliency is our third one we want to make sure that anything that's mission critical any middleware such as rabbit mq can withstand things like network partitions and provide high levels of data safety and everybody that we're speaking to at the moment seems to consider deploying RabbitMQ across multiple sites to be one of their top priorities. Um, I think it's mainly due to the pandemic, companies are having to serve increased volumes of traffic from customers shopping online, workers connecting outside of offices. Um, and another architecture we're seeing increased demand for is IoT use cases, with businesses deploying interconnected sensors across offices, shops, other retail locations, as well as things like connected vehicles. Um, if you're keeping a BDR on the agenda, then Greg Green's talk is another good one to watch out for as uh, he's demonstrating that architecture for us. And the last one is ease of use. So we want to reduce the toil associated with managing event-driven architectures, both for the application developer and the service operator. So we've been speaking to loads of customers recently about the pairing of Spring Cloud data flow, Spring Cloud streams, Spring integration, um, and the pairing of that with RabbitMQ as a brilliant way of adding both data ingestion and stream processing. So data ingestion can be from databases and the like, and that's provided from Spring's connectors. Um, there are a number of pre-built ones that are shipped with Spring, but you can also create your own. And stream processing similarly is provided via a number of ready functions shipped as part of Spring Cloud Dataflow. Again, you can create your own. So without further ado, uh, let's pass over to Michal so that he can take us through how the core team have been responding to those themes. Thank you. So the biggest change is that RabbitMQ is no longer just about queues. Starting with 3.9, we also offer streams. A stream is an append-only log with non-destructive consumer semantics. That means that if you consume a message from a stream, it's still in that stream. It does not disappear as it does from a queue. That enables a number of new use cases and features. Specifically, uh, you can replay messages. You can go over them multiple times. And that enables also a massive fan out. Until now, if you wanted to consume the same message multiple times or by multiple consumers, you had to use a fan out exchange and as many queues as there are cons uh, consumers. Uh, starting with streams, you can just deliver the message to the stream once and uh, all the consumers that need that message can just read it from that one place. Streams also offer much higher throughput with a dedicated, new dedicated protocol, which means that requires a new client library, but streams are also compatible with AMQP 091. That means you can use your existing libraries and existing applications with streams, although you will not get the throughput benefit uh, that the new protocol offers. There's a dedicated session later today uh, uh, that will provide you an overview of streams. Starting with 3.8.16, we also support Erlang 24. Erlang 24 is a very important release and includes a just-in-time compiler that offers 25 to 50% performance improvement. All you need to do is upgrade RabbitMQ and upgrade Erlang, and you should see that improvement. So that's great. We are just getting started with streams. There is more to come. Uh, we are working on competing consumers, a feature known from queues where if you attach multiple clients, multiple consumers, 
you will get a part of the data uh, for each consumer to process. Currently, if you attach multiple consumers, they will all receive all data from a stream, which uh, is a perfectly valid use case, but uh, sometimes you want to split the work between consumers. So that will be possible as well. We currently only have a mature Java client and a working Go client. We definitely want more and your help would be appreciated. So if there is a language that you care, care about, uh, you know, talk to us and uh, we want to support it. We also have an idea for a partition stream, basically a virtual stream that you can consume from and uh, publish to, which under the hood will be implemented as multiple actual streams. So that will further, that will allow further scalability of streams. But we did not forget about queues. Uh, classic queues we received a major imp uh, improvement after 3.9. Most of the work is done, but uh, this is a big change and we don't want to rush it. We want to make sure you'll be, you will see the benefits uh, without any issues. The benefits include uh, significantly reduced memory usage, about 50% lower latency, about double the throughput. That's the current estimation, of course. Things can, things can change as we keep working on that and optimize the code. Uh, they should be more predictable in terms of memory usage. And that also paves the way for additional work in simplifying how queues are implemented inside RabbitMQ. Quorum queues, we are also working on uh, the most requested feature for features for Quorum queues, that's per message TTL, that save that letter exchanging, and uh, also lower memory usage. Currently, Quorum queues have a slightly higher memory requirements than classic queues. We are working on improving that. We also continue our investment in observability based on the work with uh, Quorum queues and streams. We extracted a new library called CSHAT which is a subsystem for tracking internal counters uh, with minimal overhead. So we can increase these counters like millions of times every second. Every time a message passes a given subcomponent, we can increase a message which will allow us, allow us to uh, track more uh, accurately what's going on inside RabbitMQ. Uh, streams use this library exclusively. They do not rely on the old metric subsystem. So you know it's been proven to work. Um, we want to migrate towards that new approach everywhere over time. Uh, that work also addresses the problem of correctness of some Prometheus metrics. Um, basically, when we aggregate metrics currently, they are not actually accurate based on what happens in the cluster. Uh, that work will fix this issue. They also provide per protocol and per queue type metrics. Uh, currently the protocols, the two protocols that are supported are streams and AMQP and AMQP includes all other protocols, including MQTT and Stomp. That's because internally MQTT and Stomp are represented as AMQP inside RabbitMQ. Uh, we will work towards fixing that as well. So you will see specific metrics for specific protocols. As I mentioned, we also migrated from logger to logger. Uh, that's mostly an internal change. However, that enables additional features such as structure logging with JSON. In terms of resiliency, cluster formation should be more reliable as it no longer relies on delayed, on random startup delays of nodes. So if you start multiple nodes at the same time, they should still cluster, form a, a cluster correctly. Uh, you may have seen some issues in the past where for example, you wanted to start a five node cluster, but let's say four nodes formed the cluster together and one node started as a solo node. It basically formed a separate cluster. That should no longer happen. Um, that means that the per node startup is safe and is in fact the default in the Kubernetes operator. When you deploy random kill with the Kubernetes operator, uh, all the nodes start at the same time and they form a cluster every time. We also implemented federation for quorum queues, one of the most requested features for quorum queues. And uh, in 3.8, I believe, we added maintenance mode, which is a more graceful way of shutting down a node. Basically, you can request RabbitMQ to prepare for a shutdown of a node, and it will hand over as much work as possible before the node is actually shut down. 
We are also working on replacing Nizia as the metadata store inside Rabbit with a Raft-based uh, project called Capri. Capri will be more resilient to network partitions, uh, network issues, outages. Um, ultimately, the goal is so that you will no longer need to choose the partition handling strategy. Think pause minority, auto heal, or ignore. Um, this setting is mostly used by classic mirror queues uh, that you shouldn't use. Mirroring of classic queues is not recommended. Uh, please use quorum queues instead. And this setting was also used, well, still is used by Amnesia. But over time, as we migrate toward Capri, this setting will be basically meaningless. There is a dedicated session about Capri tomorrow to learn more. Lastly, we, want, we invested a lot of time in development experience. Uh, we now have a RabbitMQ mono repo under the RabbitMQ slash RabbitMQ server GitHub repository that includes RabbitMQ itself and all the major dependencies that we also work on. We also invested in Basel for faster feedback from the tests, the tests complete faster so that we can you know, see the issues more quickly. Um, so basically it's a great time to start contributing. If you thought about contributing to RabbitMQ, now is a great time. In particular, um, as I mentioned, we need to build stream clients in different languages. So your help would be appreciated. That's all for me and handing over to Yaron. Thank you. So I'll be speaking more about the commercial side, about the TANS RabbitMQ products. But as Ed mentioned, there are several open source components there. So you might be interested in them, even if you're not a paying customer. So just to give an overview again, and to make sure we are all on the same page, there's TANS RabbitMQ for Kubernetes. That's the um, orchestration layer that has several uh, operators that might have uh, more components in the near future. Um, this, this uh, layer manages cluster lifecycle and help you create messaging topologies in a GitOps fashion or using Kubernetes API. It also installs alerting rules. And with this layer, you can use Tanzu RabbitMQ, the, uh, the commercial image, or you can use the uh, Docker Hub uh, um, open source image. However, when you use the Tanzu RabbitMQ commercial image, there's a series of commercial plugins and the uh, operators knows how to drive them as well. And one of them is the active passive synchronization between cluster that we'll speak about today. Next slide, please. So let's speak a little bit about resiliency in uh, the Tanzu RabbitMQ um, as uh, this is a, an important um, aspect of our efforts. So upcoming is an offsite replication, which we also call OSR or active passive. Um, this will be a new commercial plugin that will be released in August. Um, it replicates quorum queues and streams based on policies that uh, defines which, which queues to replicate. And it's replicating from a, a, the upstream or the active uh, cluster to a local replication log and then uh, followers or downstream cluster or passive, depends how you want to call them, they can establish uh, links to that, uh, to that cluster and replicate from it. It has a very efficient throughput uh, with very low CPU and RAM overhead. Uh, it synchronizes both the data and the metadata. When it synchronizes the data, it does it in a safe way. So there's no uh, uh, danger of exploding the memory on the downstream cluster. Um, it's all orchestrated using Tanzu RabbitMQ for Kubernetes to remove the toys. So basically in 15 minutes or, or less, you can have a whole uh, setup of uh, DR. It minimizes the data loss and shortens the recovery time. Next slide, please. Um, another front that Ed mentioned is ease of use. So um, this is uh, probably one of the main things that we do in Tanzu RabbitMQ for Kubernetes. Um, I mentioned the two operators. So the RabbitMQ cluster lifecycle operator automates day one and day two operations. You can have zero downtime uh, configuration changes and upgrades 
that removes a lot of toil and a lot of errors. There's the messaging topology operator, which is only the first step in a journey that we plan uh, to make it much easier for uh, developers to have a whole solution with a click. Um, there's a very interesting session today, later, uh, that demonstrate this operator and uh, it, it talks more about it. And then there's a set of uh, Prometheus alerts, uh, a set of PromQL alerts that uh, covers the, the most important and critical issues on both WebMQ and the underlying Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. So you can very easily get alerted about the problems you have. And again, there's another session about that. WebMQ has a problem, let us tell you about it today. So hard choices between the, those sessions, but very interesting sessions. Next slide. And um, like uh, Ed mentioned, we also want to uh, invest in scalability. So two things that are coming up. One of them is a continuation of the active passive work. We want to um, do a cross-site stream replication. Um, so we can have a massive fan out um, in multiple geographies. Um, and the other one is we want to support a very large number of MQTT connections so we can cater better for IoT uh, applications and use cases. Next. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about Tanzu RubTMQ for VMs, um, the product that runs on Tanzu application service, also known as Cloud Foundry. So we released version 2.0. This is a long-term support version. It has a support for TLS 1.2 and 1.3. Uh, it already consumes the metrics from the Prometheus plugin, uh, which also has a um, optimization in terms of performance. And uh, it opened the config of RabbitMQ, uh, similar to what we allow in the operator. So uh, um, operators and developers have many more options. And we are now releasing MTLS support between nodes uh, with the 204 uh, patch. And that's all from me. Thank you. Back to Ed. Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, Michal. So yes, the, the next little section is on the team because RabbitMQ wouldn't be what it is today without two things, the community and the team. So wanted to give a brief nod to some team updates. So the, the really big news for us as a team is that Pivotal was acquired by VMware. And some of you may remember that Rabbit Technologies was bought by VMware in 2010, before then being spun out into Pivotal in 2013. So really we've boomeranged back. Um, we're now back in the VMware fold. And this is exciting for us and exciting for Rabbit MQ and for you all because you, we now can count on the strong financial backing of VMware. We can count on the machinery of support and services within the firm. And it means we can continue to provide the best open source experience for this community. Uh, we've also had some people leave us. We're really proud of the band of alumni who have helped make RabbitMQ what it is today. And I want to extend our thanks to the team members who have moved on to do other things, namely Jack, Jerry, and Luke. And we're also have welcomed lots of new folks to the team this year namely Phil Korozlowski, Gabrieli Santomaggio, Yaron Parasol, Loa Kugan, Alexei Lebedev, and Ilya Kaprov. Um, many of them actually come from the RabbitMQ community and therefore come with a wealth of knowledge and experience of RabbitMQ and associated projects. So welcome to you all. Thanks for your contributions thus far and looking forward to continuing working with you. Finally, the team also supported a number of speaking engagements externally, including uh, Gerhard Lazu at the Systems at Scale on Facebook, talking about streams. Uh, Gabriele also spoke at Code Motion on uh, streaming on Kubernetes. Um, for those of you, I, I don't speak Italian, but hearing RabbitMQ being talked about in Italian sounds very nice indeed. So even if you don't speak it, I'd recommend giving it a quick listen. Um, Arno spoke at the Singapore Java user group on messaging with RabbitMQ and Gerhard and David Ansari spoke at Tanzu Tuesdays and a version of that talk is actually coming up for you later in the schedule so stay tuned for that. 
it just remains for us to say thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for coming to this. Uh, there are some links here which we'd recommend you check out. First one's to the blog where you can find out more about upcoming features and released features. Uh, the next one is for the Tanzu commercial container image. And the bottom one is all about the Kubernetes operators, both open source and commercial. And uh, finally, I guess, any questions? Yep. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, in the interest of time, I will I will just ask the questions and uh, the talk question. Uh, so, what's the future of mirrored queues, and uh, will be there any uh, kind of migration procedure uh, which will help in moving from uh, mirrored queues to quorum queues? Yeah, I, I can take that. So, uh, the future of classic mirrored queues is that we're going to deprecate those. Um, we're going to announce deprecation shortly. And the idea is that um, for a number of reasons, which I won't go into now, but which we'll publish more about in the deprecation, uh, they're not recommended. Um, and quorum queues are a better option. Uh, the, there's a number of things you can change about a queue whilst after it's been created. Um, unfortunately, queue type is not one of those things. So quorum queues are a new queue type and classic queues, classic mirrored queues are another queue type. So uh, the migration path, we can publish more on that uh, when we announce deprecation and how to move between those two. Um, the long and short of it is it's likely to be a shovel type maneuver to, to move those, queue, those messages over. Okay, Th uh, thank you for your answer. The next question would be, uh... Are RabbitMQ streams uh, comparable or compatible with Kafka streams? Uh, they are comparable to Kafka streams um, in terms of the actual log. Kafka streams itself is the processing that's built into Kafka. But in terms of the data structure, the underlying data structure, they are very much comparable. Um, I won't go too much into the technical differences because uh, and, and similarities, because I think Arnaud will cover those later. But we see RabbitMQ streams as a really great alternative, especially when you want to get something up and running quickly um, that can be scaled from a local dev machine all the way up to a global scale, because it's easy to get started with, um, and easier than deploying something like a uh, Confluent platform, Kafka, or indeed something like Apache Pulsar, which has additional consistency store requirements. Um, and it, it's especially if you have existing investments, whether that's in RabbitMQ technically or RabbitMQ knowledge, then just being able to spin up a new stream, connect a stream to an existing exchange is a really low effort and low barrier way to move into something that provides the replay, uh, time traveling, the massive fan out, you know, the large logs that something like a Kafka data structure does right now. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I think uh, maybe we have one one uh, okay, uh, time for one last question. Uh, any any uh, can you say some words about the per per queue metrics? So are they available? Will be what, what is happening to those? Yeah. yeah, Michal, would you like to talk about Yeah, that? I ask for the clarification for a clarification of the question. There are per queue metrics available right now on the Prometheus endpoint. I did mention per queue type metrics. Maybe that was uh, the difference. Uh, per queue type metrics uh, will come in 3.9. Um, yeah, that's it. But uh, you know, depends on what exact metric you want. Does that mean that we will have like an aggregated metric for a quorum queue throughput? Uh, I mean, or, or something like that? Uh, Gerhard, do you want to take this one? I believe the answer is yes, but. My session is starting in how long? Nine minutes. Okay, okay yes. yes. I, we, I, have I, to, I, we have to wrap I, it up anyway. I can take this one. I thought it was nine seconds. I double checked. So I added uh, a hint to an issue uh, in the chat, in Hoover chat. It's issue 24 in Rabbit Inc. Prometheus that explains it. Um, the problem is that the high cardinality and the CPU steal from message processing is too high. So while people think they want it, what they actually want is metrics for specific queues, which are a bit more difficult to do. So the answer is yes, we want to do them, but it's not as easy as one would think. And if you think that the other 
Rabbit and Kubernetes exporter does them, well, obviously you don't know what the trade-offs are. And they're 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 too big, basically, is what I'm saying. And they depend on the HTTP API. We gave a whole talk at 2019 at Rabbit and Q Summit why that is a bad approach. So thank, thank you for the answer, Gerhard. Please post any uh, additional questions on the Woo app. I think uh, the Rabbit M2 team will will answer those questions and uh, see you at the coming talks. Yeah.